when it comes to looking at the actual terms of a contract, one of the things that lawyers and judges often struggle with is the relative importance of contractual terms. For example, say I was buying a car from you, clearly the term of the contract that says I should actually give you the money for the car is much more important than, say, where the car should actually be delivered to in the end. This is something that has been split in the past between conditions which are considered more important and warranties which are less important, but this approach has had mixed levels of success, and so we'll see how this has progressed through the years and what the more modern approach to this question is. So with that in mind, let's get started. Traditionally, the distinction has been made between conditions and warranties, and that has its origins in Section 11 of the Sale of Goods Act 1893, which makes the distinction based on what the consequences should be if there is a breach. For example, if there is a breach of the more important condition, then this is considered so serious that the um, claimant is allowed to repudiate the contract and essentially treat it as if it's never existed and they are no longer bound by it. On the other hand, for warranties which are considered to be less important, the claimant is still allowed to bring a case to the courts, but they won't be allowed to repudiate the contract, instead they will only be entitled to damages. The problem after the Sale of Goods Act 1893 was passed was that after that point, all of the lawyers just simply wanted to put all terms of all contracts into one of those two categories. Something was either a condition or it was a warranty. The problem was that this was actually pretty simplistic and didn't allow for much of a nuanced approach. Therefore, in the 1962 case of Hong Kong First Shipping, the courts approached the question of the seaworthiness of a ship in a little bit of a different way. You can imagine that seaworthiness is kind of a broad term, and on one hand of the spectrum you can imagine that if there's a little bit of chipped paint on the ship or something like that, that's relatively unimportant and isn't going to affect the seaworthiness. On the other hand, you have the other extreme, if there was a hole in the bottom of the boat or something, clearly that's going to affect the seaworthiness of the vessel, and should therefore be more serious and is perhaps arguably a condition instead. When the courts were asked what to do in this particular situation, they, should say, they said that they should actually look at what the impact of the breach was. And in Hong Kong fur shipping, it was serious enough that this um, term was considered to be a condition. So what the innominate terms, as they're called, do is essentially create a halfway house between a condition and a warranty, uh, where the courts are going to hold back their hand and not make a declaration based on what the contract itself says, but rather are going to look at what the impact of the breach was in that particular situation and then decide if something will allow for a repudiation of the contract or whether the claimant should only be entitled to damages. So this brings us to the much more modern approach which incorporates innominate terms into it. The problem is that innominate terms on their own are not good enough. We still need that distinction between conditions and warranties. There is a still going to be a value in distinguishing between terms that are either more or less important than others. The advantage of this is that having clear conditions and clear warranties means that a party to a contract doesn't have to wait until the effects of a breach are realised in order to understand the consequences. The court saw this again in the other significant case in this area, the Mahalis Angelos from 1971, where the fact that a ship was delivered three weeks late was a clear breach of a condition, even though it was kind of in that area where you might consider it to be an innominate term, it's important that the parties have that information in advance. Overall then, I think that if there's something we can conclude from this discussion, it's that there is still an important distinction to be made in the law between conditions which allow for a repudiation of the contract and warranties which simply allow a claimant to make a claim for damages based on the breach of a less important term. However, the more modern approach, which is based on innominate terms, also asks us to give this discussion a little bit more nuance and to consider the effect of a breach of a term of the contract. There may be certain circumstances where 
a warranty is breached, but it's actually considered to be a condition because of the important effect that it has actually had on the parties to the contract. And we've seen that with Hong Kong Fur. Similarly, it can work the other way as well. So we can see something that might look like a condition of the contract, but is actually more considered to be a breach of a warranty because the actual impact of the breach just isn't as important. To give you an example of that, we can look at the case of Reardon Smithline and Hanson Tangan from 1976, where it appeared to be a condition of a contract that a new ship that was being built should be built to certain specifications and in a certain city and given a certain name. Now, the ship was perfectly fine, but it was given a different name and built in a different city. Now, the party tried to repudiate that contract, saying it was the breach of a condition, but the ship was absolutely fine, and it was just the name and the place it was built that was a little bit different, which didn't really have that much impact. Therefore, it was considered to actually be a warranty, and the claimant could claim damages, but couldn't actually claim for a breach of the contract. When you're considering this question as part of, say, a problem question, try and approach it with an open mind. Consider what the term looks like within the context of the contract, and then try and make a decision based on how you would feel if there was a breach of that particular term. Is it important enough to allow for a repudiation, or should it just be considered enough for damages? And you can start to get an idea for whether something is an, inom an, an inominate term, or if it is a condition or a warranty, and you can approach your answer based on that. I hope this lecture was useful. If you did enjoy it, then make sure to leave a like below. Give us a comment as well, and if you're enjoying this series on contract law, then make sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos in the future. I'll be back soon, but for now, bye!